Welcome to Texas Heart Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. The purpose of these presentations is to inform and educate the general public as well as the physicians and allied medical personnel on the latest advances in cardiovascular medicine. I'm your host. My name is Von Krejci. I'm an inter interventional cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor College of Medicine. The topic today is incidence, causes, and treatment of pelvic congestion syndrome. Our special guest today is Dr. Brianna Costello, our international fellow at Texas Heart Institute and Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Thank you for having me, Dr. Crazier. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about pelvic congestion syndromes. So as we start off, can you just maybe describe, give us a brief descrip description of what pelvic congestion syndrome is and maybe how patients with this um, present? Very well. Pelvic congestion syndrome is commonly recognized as a persistence of chronic pelvic pain for longer than six months of duration in the absence of a known pelvic pathology. Now, we all know that the venous system functions uh, in the way that the blood is carried to the heart. So it means from the legs, from the abdomen, the blood should flow in the venous system towards the heart. What happens with pelvic congestion syndrome, this blood flow is reversed in the venous system. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, the blood flows downward towards pelvis. This is very commonly seen whenever this particular syndrome exists uh, in a ovarian vein uh, dysfunction where ovarian vein, typically left-sided ovarian vein, mm -hmm. dilates or develops uh, valvular incompetence. And uh, then uh, you get varices in the abdomen and particularly in the pelvis that causes uh, congestion and discomfort in the pelvic region. This condition is not very rare. As a matter of fact, up to 15% of women between the ages of 20 and 50 years of age will have varicose veins in the pelvis and up to 60% of those will experience some symptoms. Mm. Now, it's interesting that over 10% of gynecological referrals are due to pelvic congestion syndrome. And over 30% of pelvic pain is caused by pelvic congestion syndrome. So this entity is very common. Unfortunately, it is not frequently diagnosed in early stages of this particular condition. So, you know, you said pelvic, you know, symptoms um, or pelvic pain. What are some other symptoms of pelvic congestion syndrome or what should we look out for for our patients who have this type of, you know, issue? Well, typically it's a chronic pelvic pain. Very frequently it's misdiagnosed as endometriosis. Mm. And uh, it can be accentuated before menses and also the patients experience dysmenorrhea. Frequently, they also have this perunia, typically postcoital aching and discomfort or pain. Mm -hmm. Not infrequently, they experience dysuria and worsening of stress incontinence in certain scenarios when the patients have well advanced pelvic congestion syndrome. Discomfort also occurs with prolonged sitting or standing, which is typically in a lot of professions like medical professions, surgeries. Uh, or nurses, nurses yeah. uh, and many other professions. Pain is also very commonly experienced in lower abdomen, but also there is discomfort in the back in a large number of patients and hips as well. There are frequently encountered varicose veins in the vulva and vagina, mm -hmm. and also left lateral vaginal tenderness due to varicosities in that region. And this is obviously related to malfunction and valvular insufficiency of the left uh, ovarian vein. Mm -hmm. Not infrequently also, the patients will have hemorrhoids and symptoms related to hemorrhoids. And also irritable bowel syndrome can be accentuated or caused by pelvic congestion syndrome. And then finally, the patients will experience uh, varicose veins and chronic venous insufficiency 
in the lower extremities, obviously more commonly in the left lower extremity because of the left-sided predominance of this particular condition. Now, what is not really well known, that this particular entity or pelvic congestion syndrome also occurs in men. Huh. And this is probably, in most of the instances, misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. But men will also experience chronic pelvic pain, pain in the lower abdomen or back or hips. They will also develop left-sided varicocele. Frequently, it's called a bag of worms. Uh -huh. And uh, there will be scrotal varices, hemorrhoids are not uncommon, irritable bowel syndrome as well, dysuria, and worsening of stress incontinence, and in certain scenarios, even um, uh, erectile dysfunction, huh. and impotence uh, in general, but also um, other symptoms such as leg varicose veins and chronic venous insufficiency, again, more frequently present in the left uh, lower extremity. You know, it's interesting. I wonder, this is a touchy subject probably for both men and women, so I wonder if that number, um, you know, the prevalence or the incidence is maybe even higher, but a lot of patients are, you know, a little skittish about going to their doctor to address it because it's uncomfortable to talk about. So it's very interesting. So why, we talked a little bit about having uh, pelvic congestion in men and women, but why more in women than men? Why, you know, is there an anatomic reason or what is, what's the reason for that? Well, this is not clearly understood, uh, but uh, there are certainly some uh, factors that are clearly explained. Mm. It is uh, not infrequently genetically transmitted type of entity or okay. condition. It is uh, probably related more to uh, pregnancy mm -hmm. and uh, issues related to pregnancy, such as compression of the mm -hmm. pelvic veins during pregnancy. There is also in women, as you know, uh, we did present and discuss this in a previous uh, presentation, mm -hmm. May Turner syndrome or iliac vein compression syndrome is more commonly seen in women than mm -hmm. men. So this is another potential reason. So as far as the causes of pelvic congestion syndrome is concerned, we have two prominent factors that are playing a role. One is, as we mentioned, May Turner syndrome that's compressing either the left common iliac vein or iliac vein on the left or right side in any location. Mm -hmm. And then another one is so-called nutcracker syndrome, which is a compression of the left renal vein by um, superior mesenteric artery. Mm -hmm. And actually the ref left renal vein is being compressed between the superior mesenteric artery, as we can see here. Mm -hmm and uh, the abdominal aorta. So what is typically seen is uh, with invasive or non-invasive evaluation, enlarged uh, left ovarian vein mm -hmm. due to that compression, and valvular incompetence of the left ovarian vein, and then large varices that we can see here in the pelvis, particularly around the uterus and uh, urinary bladder. On the other hand, May Turner syndrome is only related to compression of the iliac right. veins. As we can see here on the bottom right image with a CT, there is a severe compression of the left common iliac vein by the right common iliac artery that's crossing from the left side to the right side. Now, as far as uh, certain facts uh, related to the pelvic congestion syndrome and the magnitude of this problem, in my opinion, this condition is the most underdiagnosed and the most ignored mm -hmm. and the most misdiagnosed and the most undertreated medical condition to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. And you touched on a few of these reasons, but what do you think the biggest reason is for that? Well. There are several factors that are playing a significant role, but the most important one is delayed diagnosis, mm -hmm. obviously by patients and physicians, or yeah. lack of knowledge, poor understanding of pelvic veins mm -hmm. by clinicians. The average number of diagnostic tests prior to proper diagnosis is at least four, mm -hmm. 
And uh, it takes on an average four years to establish the diagnosis. That information is available in the literature. And several patients wait for over 20 years with symptoms to develop proper diagnosis and treatment of this condition. And you can imagine, like you said, a lot of these women have been pregnant or have gone through pregnancies, so a lot of their symptoms could be just, you know, pushed aside as, you know, postpartum, you know, changes and, you know, uterus changes after delivering a baby, but in fact, maybe they could have this as the real, you know, etiology of their pain or discomfort, so it's good to keep in mind. So what are the best tests, in your opinion, or, you know, in general, to diagnose or work up this type of pelvic pain and diagnose uh, the issue? You know, it's uh, sad to say, and it's so disappointing that this condition is so um, poorly understood mm -hmm. and misdiagnosed because we have simple tests that can clearly establish the diagnosis. Just a simple abdominal and pelvic duplex or ultrasound scan can reliably establish the diagnosis. Wow. Transvaginal duplex is also very useful mm -hmm. to look at the varicose veins related to the post um, pelvic congestion syndrome. And this can be done on outpatient basis mm -hmm. in physician's office. It's painless, uh, inexpensive, and very reliable. But uh, once we establish the diagnosis with the ultrasound or duplex scan, additional tests might be of benefit. Unfortunately, they're not frequently ordered right. and interpreted properly. But for instance, a CT of the abdomen and pelvis and magnetic resonance, particularly MRV of the venous system, is very useful mm -hmm. and clearly diagnostic of this condition and it can help us in differentiating uh, not, the nutcracker syndrome or compression of the left iliac vein versus uh, May Turner okay. syndrome. Mm -hmm. That also is commonly seen. And a lot of patients actually will have both, both. conditions yeah. at the same time. I can imagine the symptoms that you can have if you have both. That would be pretty you know, uncomfortable. Right. All right, so what is in your differential when you see a patient in the clinic with pelvic pain and you're maybe wondering if it could be pelvic congestion syndrome? One of the most uh, common conditions uh, is uh, problems with some kind of arthritis or inflammatory process like uh, lumbosacral spine, degenerative arthritis, mm -hmm. low back pain, uh, sciatica, again, due to disc compression, sacroiliac joint inflammatory uh, arthritis and there are several conditions like that mm -hmm. and uh, several other ones that uh, are uh, maybe not clearly understood mm -hmm. but uh, inflammatory process of any kind including gastrointestinal type of chronic right. inflammatory disease yeah. would be very commonly um, be included in differential in the diagnosis. Very good. So when you've identified your patients um, of having pelvic congestion syndrome, what's, you know, what's the treatment options? What do you talk with them about as possibilities uh, to help with their symptoms? I usually uh, use an algorithm in uh, explaining to my patients and also to referring physicians how to evaluate and how to treat this condition. Mm -hmm. And I certainly hope that this approach will help in establishing a diagnosis in great majority of patients without significant delay. Yeah. So in my consideration, any patient with chronic pelvic pain that cannot be explained with any other condition mm -hmm. should be evaluated with uh, abdominal and pelvic uh, duplex scan mm -hmm. and in women with transvaginal duplex scan. And if there is evidence of compression, either due to May Turner or the nutcracker, and presence of varicosities, then I would suggest to order either MRV or CTA. Yeah. I prefer MRV because uh, there is no radiation mm -hmm. and uh, it's as sensitive and diagnostic as CTA, which obviously uh, includes radiation. Right. And especially in this young female population, avoiding radiation would be ideal. Right. Um, mm -hmm. All right, very good. So then once we establish the diagnosis that there is pelvic and left uh, renal 
vein abnormality from the MRV or CTA or non-invasive evaluation, then we have to establish the diagnosis. Is it related to May Turner or is it related to Nutcracker or is it both okay. conditions okay. that are causing the problems? If we have a reflux, typically like in ovarian vein, left ovarian vein, the treatment is simple and straightforward. It's embolization mm -hmm. of that insufficient, incompetent, enlarged vein that has a lot of varicosity. So all of those conditions, whether it's May Turner or Nutcracker, can be treated via endovascular interventions. It is extremely rare that you need to resort to surgical treatment of this condition. That's great. So if there is compression, obviously stenting is the treatment of choice. Uh, for May for Turner, Turner, anyway. Turner, obviously that's, mm -hmm. that's a must because you have to overcome that compression from the artery okay. mm -hmm. that has systemic pressure and venous pressure is very low. And also in certain scenarios when we have a, the nutcracker syndrome, you have to stent the left renal vein. And the indication for that would be only when the patient has uh, symptoms related to that compression and the compression is uh, putting a patient at risk of developing left renal vein thrombosis. Uh -huh. So typically, a patient will have dysuria, they will have hematuria, and uh, left flank pain that will be persistent. And in that kind of a situation, stenting would be indicated. In your opinion, what percentage of patients with uh, pelvic congestion syndrome get stented in the renal vein? Is it a large proportion, a large percentage, or is it the, um, you know, the minority of patients that you actually have to stent the vein? Obviously, this depends on the patient and the patient's symptoms. Mm -hmm. And if there's any evidence of progression of disease and progression of symptoms. But I would say that um, the great majority of patients will require treatment because this condition is progressive. It gets worse over a period of time. And it, in a lot of instances, can be uh, debilitating. Yeah. So here we have actually the images of MRV and uh, the treatment for the nutcracker syndrome in mm -hmm. particular. And uh, what we can see here on the right-hand side, this patient already had coils in enlarged, incompetent left uh, ovarian vein. And that usually should give... Uh, alleviation of symptoms and improvement in a very short period of time in great majority of patients. All right, so can you share with us maybe an experience or two with your um, treatment of pelvic congestion syndrome? Well, as you know, you were involved in several cases. That's right. As a matter of fact, one just yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> so it's not uncommon to see this type of patients. I would like to share with the participants of this uh, presentation, one of the patients that we treated relatively recently. And this patient was a 33-year-old female with a history of two previous pregnancies, uh, complaining of abdominal, lower back, and left leg pain. Also, she experienced dyspareunia and had a vaginal and a, a vulvar varices um, which uh, have been bothering her for a very long period of time, since uh, actually her teenage years. Wow. So she was quite uh, incapacitated with her symptoms and was referred to us uh, for further evaluation without proper diagnosis being established. Mm -hmm. She saw numerous uh, practitioners, including an orthopedic surgeon for evaluation of her lumbosacral spine, several gynecologists, uh, and they did not establish proper diagnosis. So what we did is we evaluated her at our office, obtained abdominal, pelvic, and vaginal uh, ultrasound, and then proceeded with the uh, MRV, and we established a diagnosis that she had pelvic congestion syndrome. Now, what was very interesting that she had a more advanced and more complex pelvic congestion syndrome because she had incompetent, enlarged left uh, ovarian vein mm -hmm. with huge varices, and also she had a May Turner syndrome. Mm. Wow. It's no wonder her symptoms were present for so long, 20 right. years, you know. So 
here we have the images of her CT angiogram of the abdomen and pelvis, and we can see that her left uh, ovarian vein was um, close to 11 millimeters in diameter, which is probably three times yeah. larger than normal. And also on the right-hand side, in uh, the section right at the superior mesenteric and left renal vein, we can see that the left renal vein is compressed to close to 90% with enlargement of the left renal vein post-compression uh, wow. with significant dilatation. And also looking at her pelvic images, we can see on this uh, CT that uh, she had Huge. large varicosities around her uterus and also urinary bladder, not only on the left side, but also on the right side. And obviously, the reason that the right side was enlarged as well with varicosities is because the venous blood had to drain through the right side because there was severe compression of the left renal vein by the superior mesenteric artery. So here we can see the treatment. The treatment is pretty straightforward. It's done on outpatient basis under local anesthesia. Typically we use a five French catheters. Here we use the renal double curve diagnostic catheter. We entered into the left renal vein and obtained an angiogram. And we can see in the middle panel mm -hmm. dilated the left ovarian vein that's also incompetent as we can see also on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. On the left hand side, we can see a diagrammatic representation of what needs to be done. Basically placing coils and occasionally using sclerotherapy mm -hmm. to uh, thrombose that uh, disease, the incompetent ovarian vein. Now here we can see that the catheter is advanced distally to the distal part of the left ovarian vein, and this is showed with a red arrow. And we can clearly see now on uh, the middle panel that we have a uh, huge yes. varices in the pelvis around the uterus going from the left to the right. And uh, then we can see in the still image on the right hand side, uh, several actually varicosities um, that need to be addressed at the same time. So we proceeded with coil embolization of the left ovarian vein, as we can see. Typically, we start very distally mm -hmm. to address all the varicosities that are clearly seen and then gradually build up this uh, uh, <clears throat> endovascular coil occlusion all the way to a few centimeters from the origin of the left ovarian vein. And then we can see on the completion angiogram that there is no longer flow in the left ovarian vein. So that indicates a successful treatment of this particular condition in this particular patient. On the left-hand side, we can actually see on a still image evidence of compression mm -hmm. of the left um, renal. renal vein, which we didn't stent at that time mm -hmm. because the patient did not have any urinary symptoms such as left flank pain or hematuria. And we typically like to reserve stenting only for patients that have obvious signs that uh, the left uh, renal vein is in jeopardy and at risk mm -hmm. of thrombosis. Very good. So for this patient, did she improve? Were her symptoms better after this? Well, uh, she improved to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. She had less back pain. She had less uh, left-sided pelvic pain but she still had some symptoms. And uh, so she uh, felt like uh, she needed to have some other procedure done to address and correct this problem. Now, what we decided to do is to wait for a few months mm -hmm. because this condition uh, requires a little bit longer treatment and follow-up until you see Im significant improvements because there are numerous varicosities and they have to shrink over a period of time. And the, typically the symptoms do not disappear within a few days or, or a month. 
So after two months, she still had some uh, symptoms that were obviously related to uh, pelvic congestion syndrome and also iliac vein compression. Mm -hmm. As you know, as I mentioned previously, she has uh, or had May Turner syndrome. So we uh, proceeded with um, venogram and uh, intravascular ultrasound of the left iliac vein. And on the left hand side, we can see a still image where we can uh, at least have a suspicion mm -hmm. that there is a compression of the left common iliac vein because of certain haziness, yeah. or what we call pancaking, of that vein that is being compressed by the right common iliac artery. We can see also endovascular coils in the left uh, ovarian vein, and we don't see any flow in it, which is a good sign yeah. that we have at least achieved that successful treatment uh, for the pelvic congestion syndrome. Now, we also interrogated the left um, renal vein and we performed IVUS and we saw that there was no severe obstruction of the vein. left um, renal vein. The flow was adequate, but the left uh, ovarian vein was occluded as we can see it does not fill through that flow. We performed an intravascular ultrasound of the left uh, common iliac vein and we can see on the left hand panel there is severe compression of that vein. It's shown by the arrow mm -hmm. and where the catheter is. Yeah, that's highly compressed, wow. Right. And then we measured it and actually the opening was somewhere in the range of two to three millimeters. Wow. So what did you do next? Well, obviously we had to address and correct this problem. Balloon angioplasty does not work for this condition. And that has to do with, you know, the systemic pressure of the aorta or, you know, of the artery. Artery. Uh, yeah. Right. So we placed uh, 18 millimeters in diameter stent, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. There are several of them now available mm -hmm. on the market that are dedicated for this particular application. We can see on the right-hand side the completion angiogram showing excellent flow and on repeat IVUS, there was no evidence of compression. And on the left-hand side, we can see balloon angioplasty being performed after the stent was deployed. And using the intravascular ultrasound, now we can see that uh, wow. the left common iliac vein is fully open. Mm -hmm. There is no evidence of compression. On the right-hand side, we can see the glimpses uh, of the stent in there mm -hmm. and no evidence of compression. So this certainly had to help her. So did she feel better after this? She felt better. Good. And I, w I was also encouraged. <laughs> you felt better too. <laughs> and uh, I saw her about two months after the treatment mm -hmm. and she said to me, which was relatively recently, that she's totally symptom free. Oh, that's wonderful. Totally symptom free. Not only related to her back pain or pelvic pain, or any pelvic discomfort, but also total disappearance of left leg discomfort as well. That's great. That's a great end to that story. Um, well, thank you very much. This was great to be here um, with you today and learn about something that most of us don't think about on a daily basis. Well, thank you very much for being with me, discussing this, and uh, I appreciate uh, all of your questions. Great, look forward to the next one. So, I think...